war in Vietnam has literally become a fight on two fronts. On one hand, the government faces the Viet Cong communists, and on the other hand, it faces a revolt of the Buddhist majority, a fight which has been joined by thousands of students. The capital, Saigon, is an armed camp, as the regime of President Diem calls a mass meeting to profess faith in his rule. Helicopters are the workhorses of any battle action, the only quick means of travel in this land of swamp and jungle. When reports of the enemy come in, the whirlybirds go into action. This is a foray on the Kamau Peninsula. The communists moved into a village during the night and were cut off in a surprise action. The copters move in with South Vietnam troops to wipe them out. I think the one thing that almost every American that I've spoken with who's been to Vietnam can't believe is how friendly the Vietnamese are, how little anger, how little hostility from what we did to that country in the 60s and 70s. They seem to have recovered completely, much better than we did, and yet it was their country. They've put it in their history. They love Americans. English is the official second language of the country. They figured it out, and that's one of the things I'm trying to figure out. How have they been able to do that, and yet we don't seem to be able to do that? Is it their Buddhist background versus our Judeo-Christian background? What is it? Is it religion? It can't be simply religion. It, it has to be a whole series pile of things that, that allow them to no longer hate their former enemies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know you have a daughter who was affected by Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. and so this painting is your daughter in the Agent Orange. This is the Vietnam. This is the portrait of their daughter and the the Agent Orange in the background or the color orange symbolizes the chemical that we sprayed to defoliate the country and caused a lot of uh, birth defects. I've made probably 50 trips back to Vietnam over, since 1987, since that first trip, or second trip, I and mean, the first one being 69. Now I go mostly because most of my best friends live in Vietnam. I've really developed a very close, not just working, but friendly relationship with dozens and dozens of Vietnamese artists and writers and teachers and, and kids and their children and their grandchildren. I get emails every day from friends in Vietnam. Oh, I have, I'm sure more friends in Vietnam than I do in America at this point. The other reason I go back is, is to guilt. Guilt is a great motivator. It's, it can't motivate you all the way down the road, but my guilt from what we did as a country, not just me as an individual soldier, but what we did in poisoning the country and bombing and creating a war on their land, not on our soil, the guilt that I have from that drives me back to try to do something positive from a horrible beginning. If you were a male and you had two legs and two arms and a head and you could speak uh, in sentences, you were quickly drafted. Uh, so I, in order to avoid the draft, enlisted in June of 1968. I graduated from art school, got married, and enlisted in the Army. I finished my training, my advanced training in Virginia, and they post on the board who's going to Vietnam. And, Every day you go out and you look and you hope your name's not on that list. And one day I went out and my name was on that list. So of course your immediate thought is, is terror. 
we've seen the pictures on the news every night of Vietnam, and those images were horrifying, and I'm going to be thrown into the middle of that. I just learned how to shoot a rifle, never had a gun as a child, or even a BB gun, and then suddenly I'm going to be in this horrible war, trying to stay alive, and, and even worse, trying to kill other people. I can remember the night before I left for Vietnam, and I remember sitting on the couch with my wife just crying like a baby. And it comes back to me now, um, just out of fear and out of concern, and just horror that, that I wouldn't come back and she would be a widow at 21. You know. My main guilt as a soldier was my unit sprayed a lot of Agent Orange because we were an engineer unit and we defoliated along the sides of the roads that we were building and paving 300 yards on each side. So that was all sprayed with Agent Orange. As, and as we now know, it causes very severe birth defects and cancers. I worried when my wife was pregnant with our children and I worried when our children are now having their children because it does go down generations. Agent Orange is a dioxin, and it doesn't really ever get out of your system. I landed in Vietnam on April 11th, 1969, a date you never forget. On April 12th, you begin what's called a short timer's calendar, and you have this piece of paper with 365 days numbered individually squares on that calendar, and day by day you cross out, you cover up, until 364. Our goal as soldiers in Vietnam was not to win the war. It was to, to fill in that 365th day and leave. I ended up getting an early out because it was 1970 and Nixon had begun to withdraw troops early. It ended up saving my life because after I left, one of the helicopters that I had flown in was shot down. It's a 50-50 chance I, I would have been on that chopper. Nobody survived the crash. When you get to Cameron Bay, you spend a couple days and then you go to the plane that's going to take you back to the world, we used to call it. You can't imagine the excitement, surviving it. And, and, and even when you're on the stairs, there's always this myth, they're going to get me going up the stairs as a sniper. So you get in the plane, they shut the door, and when you take off on the runway, the plane just broke into enormous applause. Everybody was so happy to, be, to survive the year and to be going back to the world. And, family and friends. And most of us would say, I'm going to go back to, to the world and I'm going to mail you a quarter pounder with cheese. I'm going to mail you a hamburger. It was, there were certain foods that, that we missed. But the one thing that I wanted to do, which, which I hadn't been able to do for a year, was just walk in the woods. Just something as simple as being in the woods and, and just nobody shooting at me. No mines, nothing. Because I come from Maine, and we lived, we lived on a lot of land. We had big wooded areas. I used to love to go out in the woods as a kid and just walk, you know, and walk in the trees and the brook. And you couldn't do that in Vietnam. You had to be constantly afraid. And I just wanted to come back and go to Maine and walk. For several years after I came back, maybe two or three years, I had two reoccurring nightmares. One was that I was going to be sent back. I didn't do the job properly, and they were going to send me back. And I would usually wake up before I actually got back there, but it was that fear of going back and not knowing. And I was going to have to really fight this time and kill people and maybe be killed. Every morning I wake up, I'm reminded of Vietnam. But as much as I could, like the rest of our culture, I did put it on the back burner to, to go on with life. For me, my art has always been a kind of uh, art therapy. When I, when I first came back in 1970, I remember very vividly locking myself in the basement where there was a cement floor, taking a box of paints and a lot of paper, because I'm a printmaker, I work mostly on paper, not canvas, and just painting my heart out. If I hadn't had that period, I probably would have been more like a lot of veterans with very severe PTSD. But I think my art allowed me a way to, to express my anger and my frustration and get it out of my head onto a piece of paper. And without the art, I don't know where I would be today. These are the two lithographs that I did from paintings that I made shortly after I came back from Vietnam in 1970-71. Uh, they're part of the series of work that I gave to the museum in Hanoi in 87. Why were, you, why were you so enamored of the, the children? They're beautiful. 
and I'm I, at that time I was a figurative artist. I loved to draw the face and the figure, and I wanted to show a beautiful picture of Vietnam. So what could be more beautiful than the children of Vietnam? The constant image I have in my head of, of the children of Vietnam is every time I would stop my jeep. I would be totally surrounded by these beautiful little children who are happy and playful. And here I am in a uniform with an M16. I've got a, a 60 caliber machine gun mounted on my Jeep, a box full of grenades. And these kids are coming around me like I'm the ice cream man. Well, these, these children, they not only survived, but they grew. And I, many of them died, but the ones that didn't, that weren't killed or poisoned with Agent Orange, survived it and grew and are now young adults or middle-aged adults now, many of them. And it just, it, it's remarkable to me that, that they were able to do that. And incredibly resilient people. And I'd, I'd love to have half of that myself. After I finished the Vietnam series in the early 70s, mid 70s, uh, I decided I'd, enough of this Vietnam stuff. And the war ended in 75, so that's the end of it. So I started doing these quite commercially successful images of beautiful women. For almost 10, 15 years, I didn't really think too much about Vietnam, and it was not at all a part of my professional life. But then that trip back in 87 kind of reignited my passion and my need to kind of re-educate America. So I decided I want to go back to Vietnam. I always knew I'd go back. When I left in 1970 and came back to Maine, uh, I said to my parents, I'm going back to Vietnam someday, and they looked at me like I was crazy. But I knew I was going to go back. In 1987, it was really the first opportunity that I had as an individual. That my life was in the right position, my teaching career, my art career. So I decided to go. I just wanted to learn more. I wanted to find out, what are these people all about? How did they survive this horrible devastation that we put them through with bombing and Agent Orange and, and on and on and on for 10 years? And 10 years with the French before that, and 100 years of occupation with the French before that, and a thousand years of Chinese before that. I wanted to figure out, for my own sake, how they did that. And so the trip back in 1987 was my first chance to really find out, answer that question. And we landed in Hanoi, the capital of what I always thought was communist Vietnam. And my fear of the communists was that they were kind of green-headed, evil people that were going to bury me, as Khrushchev said. But everybody I met, all these communists that I'd been taught were evil, would smile and say, have a, nice, have a nice time in Vietnam. We hope you enjoy our country. And we spent three weeks in Vietnam traveling up and down the country and basically falling in love with it. I guess the thing that motivated me the most to put together this exhibit called To See By Both Sides was that 1987 visit to Hanoi, to Vietnam. I carried a bunch of my paintings that I wanted to give to the Vietnamese. And I had this chance meeting at the National Museum of Fine Arts with the director, deputy, then deputy director. And then we sat down over some hot, hot beer. It's probably 100 degrees, as Vietnam often is. And we started to talk about life. And we came up with this idea for a small exhibit that was going to be at Emmanuel College, where I taught maybe two or three artists from each country talking to each other for the first time about the war. That grew into a major exhibition with 20 artists from America and 20 artists from Vietnam, two paintings each, so there were 80 paintings in it. That traveled to 15 museums in the United States and three in Vietnam. And I was often greeted by veterans and Vietnamese Americans who, for the first time, saw the other side and thanked me for it. Of course, there were some that said, what are you doing showing this communist propaganda? But that was a minority. I was on television, radios, newspapers. Very little negative response to the exhibit. You ask an artist, how, how long did it take you to do that image? You know, the standard answer is 50 years. Because it may take five minutes to do the image, but it takes 50 years to learn how to do the image. Tong is 38, so he's been practicing for probably 20 years. Every summer, the Indochina Arts Partnership sponsors an artist from Vietnam to come to Boston, to come to Wellesley, and make a print, or make many prints. We've done this ever since I built my new studio about four or five years ago. So I think Tang is maybe the sixth artist who's come. 
They're not printmakers. I'm a printmaker. My master's degree from RISD is in printmaking. For me, it's a treat to be able to show them lithography. And when I saw Tang's work in Hanoi last fall, I said, oh, God, these paintings are lithographs. They need to be made into prints. So we met through a mutual friend, and we invited Tang to come. He's been here about 10 days and made a 10 prints. <laughs> Some sound for you. <laughs> All right, now that's ready to take over to the press, and then we'll process this on the press very carefully. Tang is a, one of what are called the new gang of five. 20 years ago, there were no galleries. There was no commercial world in Hanoi. It was a communist-controlled economy. Người bạn tốt của chúng tôi, đây là lần đầu tiên tôi tới nước Mỹ. Lần đầu tiên tôi phải đi bằng máy bay, rất là sợ. Nhưng mà khi sang đến đây thì cảm giác rất là yên lành, rất tốt đẹp. Thứ nhất là không khí ở ở nước Mỹ ở ở khu vực này rất là trong lành, fresh. Và tôi được tiếp đón rất là ân cần, tử tế chu đáo và David đã tạo điều kiện cho tôi làm việc ở đây rất là thoải mái và chỉ có mấy ngày thôi nhưng mà tôi sáng tạo được rất là nhiều rất là nhiều tác phẩm. Last summer the visiting artists we had was one of the most interesting projects we've ever done. It was a huge installation. It was actually done in the neighbor's yard across the street. Very generous neighbors let us use their entire yard, and it was a big yard. We hung 150 lanterns, silk lanterns, each being about 15 feet tall. Each of the lantern completely covered with this Vietnamese Han Nom script, the ancient script done by the artist Viet, who came last summer. We invited 50 people for the opening, and each person wore a lavender robe covered with, again, with these poems in Vietnamese Han Nom. We invited them in the evening, so they came at, when the sun was just going down. Each of the lanterns was illuminated from inside. You couldn't see that when, the, when it was daylight, but as the sun went down and it got dark, the lanterns just began to glow. And it was one of the most magical, incredible experiences I've ever seen anywhere. For those 50 people who came, and people read about it in the newspaper and magazines, you know, they, they again had to think of Vietnam as something other than the war. Because when you say Vietnam to 99% of Americans, the only thing they know is the war. But, you know, there was a 4,000 year history before the war. And there'll be a, hopefully another 4,000 year history after the war. And, and the artists we bring teach Americans that this is a deep, rich, wonderful, beautiful culture. Wow. They're just beautiful. Fabulous, thank you. Yes. Really wonderful. This is the third time uh, the artist has been in the United States, but this is the first time ever, um, you know, a premiere of his work. We would like to thank everyone for being here tonight. Và đặc biệt cảm ơn David và cái Window Center Fantasy. Especially David and the IAP. I guess as much as anybody can ever go beyond war, I feel I have. Again, because I've studied it from all sides, and I think I have a clearer picture that allows me to put it in the right place. I no longer have the nightmares I had as a, as a returning soldier. I now have dreams of going back to Vietnam to be with friends and learn more about their country and their culture. So in that sense, I've gone way beyond where I was in 1969 or 1987. Vietnam will never leave me, but it's, it's, I have gone beyond the initial stages into another phase of Vietnam. And on the day I die, I'll probably think of Vietnam. I, my kids call me Ho Chi Minh. I personally think it's very important that we continue to study Vietnam because we haven't gotten it right yet. Once we get it right, then I think we can move on, but not forget it, but at least have a clear picture about, about that relationship and where it went wrong. Because we're, we seem to be repeating it again, but we need to keep studying it until we get it right.
this is the third time uh, the artist has been in the United States, but this is the first time ever, um, you know, a premiere of his work in an outdoor exhibition like this and have everyone here as part of the installation. We would like to thank everyone for being here tonight. Và đặc biệt cảm ơn uh, David và cái Indosign ở Panasonic. Especially David and the IAP. muốn cảm ơn tất cả mọi người ở đây. And he, uh, he would like to thank everyone for being here tonight. Và đặc biệt cảm ơn uh, David và cái Indosign ở Panasonic. Okay, uh, especially um, David and the IAP.